Okay, it's, uh, so it's 4.15. Uh, let's get started uh, with the introductions. Uh, my name is Mohsin Ahmed. Uh, I'm a senior systems engineer uh, in the cloud engineering team at Portmore Company. Hello, I'm Shaji Thomas. I'm team lead for PCF operations at Ford Motor Company. Hi, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Hayden Ryan. I'm an advisory solutions architect for Pivotal. Uh, I work in the customer delivery team and have been out in Dearborn working with these guys since, well, October. I'm Dave Walraff and I work with Hayden. All right. So let's get into the presentation. So it's an exciting time to be working in the automotive industry. There's an immense activity going on, whether it's in the field of connected cars or it's in the field of self-driving autonomous vehicles. Ford Motor Company is at the forefront of research and innovation in all these fields. Continuously working on making products and services that people want and value. Going further on making people's lives better, Ford recently announced its transformation plan with the creation of Ford Smart Mobility, a fully owned subsidiary to expand from an automotive to both an auto and a mobility company. This strategy will allow Ford to stay focused on strengthening and focusing on its core business, which is manufacturing cars, trucks, and utilities, and at the same time, aggressively pursuing emerging opportunities through Ford Smart Mobility to transform the customer experience to a new dimension. Transforming Ford's customer experience is core to our strategy. The launch of Ford Pass is a part of Ford Smart Mobility Initiative and the beginning of Ford's transition into an auto and mobility company. Ford had teamed up with Pivotal to deliver Ford Pass that we launched earlier this month over Cloud Foundry in Azure Public Cloud. The popularity of Uber and Lyft clearly demonstrates the shift in consumer preferences where they are moving towards mobility solutions as opposed to auto ownership. The automotive landscape is changing, and Ford's initiative with the launch of Ford Pass will boost the company's growth in future. Ford Pass is not just a cloud-native application. Rather, it's a platform of integrating digital, physical, and personal experiences with four main parts, which is going to change and transform the overall customer experience. Ford Marketplace for mobility solutions, Ford Guides, who are always there to help and assist. Ford Appreciation, where members are rewarded for their loyalty and consuming the services. And Ford Hubs, where consumers can experience and explore <coughs> our latest innovations. It's available both on Android and iOS platforms and is open to everyone, whether you own a Ford or not, just by registering online. We believe that great experiences build long-term relationships. From a business, business standpoint, it will drive better loyalty, bring in new consumers, and accelerate forward in becoming a serious player and a leader in the mobility services. With the launch of Ford Pass, the journey has just started towards making Ford an auto and a mobility company. Next, I'd like to share a short video that would show the feature set of Ford Pass and give you an insight of the platform. Driven by a passion to make people's lives better, Ford is going further to change how the world moves. To do this, we've created a new product platform, Ford Pass, an ecosystem of digital, physical, and personal solutions that empower you with more mobility options so you can go further. The digital engine that connects to every feature of the ecosystem is the Ford Pass app. It lets you book a service appointment with your local dealer with just a few clicks, or borrow the vehicle you need when you need it, or find and secure parking spaces in a busy city, and gain access to the parking garage using only your phone. When your car is done being serviced, the Ford Pass app will let you know it's ready for pickup and provide your service records virtually. Integral to everything is your supportive Ford guide who can solve or facilitate any mobility need you might have. Initial Ford hubs in New York, London, 
Shanghai, and San Francisco invite you to see, shape, and experience what the transportation of tomorrow could be. Imagine Ford Pass, guides, and hubs all working together with cities to provide remarkable mobility solutions. And best of all, we can now show our appreciation in a few ways. With Ford Pass Points, an opportunity for us to say thanks for your loyalty with points you can earn and redeem over time. And with Ford Pass Perks, benefits from affinity partners like McDonald's, 7-Eleven, or Spotify that can help make any journey more enjoyable. Behind the scenes, we've built a new way of working together to create this Ford Pass ecosystem to give our customers of today and tomorrow what they need to go further than they ever thought possible. Impressive, huh? So Ford Pass is all hosted on Cloud Foundry. <laughs> Thank you. So that was just a glimpse of the Ford Pass, and it would continuously grow and evolve. There are more features being added, like locating your vehicle, lock, unlock, and remote start of your cars right from your smartphones. The scope of rest of the presentation is around the infrastructure design, development, and implementation of Cloud Foundry on the Azure public cloud that provided a platform to host Ford Pass. Next, my colleague, Shaji Thomas, will walk us through the plan, build, and operate model, and how we transform the IT side to achieve our goal of launching Ford Pass on Cloud Foundry. Shaji. Thanks, Mohsen. So how was Ford Company, a traditional company, able to develop a Ford Pass app using the PCF infrastructure? This is uh, much different than how we traditionally do it. We're a very process-driven, company with lots of meetings to go through and, and processes to follow. The old way we would have, the app team would come to our solutions, customer solutions team, and they would work with our global fulfillment planning team, who would work with our global fulfillment implementation team, and then they would end up working with our engineering team, who would give us the final checklist to do a deployment. <coughs> but we wanted to move to these zero time zero downtime upgrades and to be able to deploy within minutes. So we started moving to more of self-service tools to give our, our end customers, meaning the app teams, more self-service tools like the APM manager and they were able, now they're able to do their CF push themselves as opposed to involving our team, the operations team. They can roll their changes from dev, QA to prod. So Ford Motor Company is very risk adverse. Failure at an automotive company is, can mean bankruptcy. It can, you write some bad code and 15 years later it can come back and through the NTSB they have recalls, why is it emitting so, many, so much emissions? And you have to explain some code, bad code that you wrote 15, 20 years ago. So, and then you have to go through a whole recall process. It's a very time consuming and painful process. So as I said, it, we use the plan, build, operate model. So planning and architecture will build an idea, then engineering will make sure it works, and then they hand over a checklist to us to, to uh, fulfill, to build it. This produces a, a high quality final product. So, one of the processes we had to work through was how do we coordinate three companies working together. So traditionally at Ford, we had an incident manager that would coordinate all the different teams. And if we had outage, they would coordinate the global cloud operations teams with the PCF operations team. And they would, with the incident manager would interface with upper management and explain when, what's happening. But now we have Microsoft Azure, we have Pivotal, we have our team and all the, our sub teams. So now we integrated that with our with what the incident manager team that we have, and we integrate that with the critical situation team that Microsoft has, and then the on-site engineers that Pivotal has. So, so how do we move forward to this new agile environment? So we had to go through and break our normal operations. 
we traditionally, if we had any scheduled operations activity, it had to be done during our maintenance window, which is usually 3 a.m. in the morning to 11 a.m. on Sundays. And to do an, an upgrade during that time, we would have to fill out what would we, what's called a, a GEEK, or a Global Infrastructure Change Request. All global infrastructure change requests have to be filled out 10 days in advance. So there's a waiting period. And in those 10 days, it gives any manager or app team opportunity to reject the change and push it off. So if we had a patch, it would have to wait until it gets through the whole system. There also have, we also have these traditional freezes. We have the Christmas freeze, we have an auto show freeze, we have a quarterly freeze for doing the financials. But now with, the, with using CF, we're using the IT advisory method. So basically you sign up for a, a bulk mail list and when we do a deployment or an upgrade, we just send an IT advisory out that the system is getting upgraded, dramatically reducing the time that it, goes, it takes to go through an upgrade. So on this slide, I wanted to talk a little bit how, how Pivotal, what Pivotal gave us and how we made it work at Ford. So we had to kind of blend the two, two approaches. So with monitoring and alerting, Pivotal was successfully using Datadog and they were starting to use the Elk Tile for monitoring. But at Ford, we had a lot of experience using Splunk. So we were able to create dashboards using Splunk to model after what Pivotal was doing using Datadog. We put syslog relay servers and heavy forwarders in the cloud, both on east and west in Azure for production and pre-production. And then we would move the JMX data back to Ford, the Ford dashboards. And Ford's network is closed off. It's a private, you know, from the internet. So we had to put another syslog relay server and heavy forwarder in our DMZ to forward that data back to our dashboards. The next thing that we had to blend together was the jump servers. The template that was provided to us from, from Microsoft was using Ubuntu, but at Ford, we're a slice shop. So we had to go through and, and rework it. <coughs> so we have a ton of tools that use SLES, the pa our password vaulting tool, which would go in and automatically change the password, all these things. So we needed to get a, a SLES tool. So we're currently working with our Linux engineering team to come up with a Ford OS version for the SLES in the cloud. We're also trying to recycle our processes for incident management, requests, requests and then problem management. So now we're moving on to our, our global launch, which will soon be deploying into China on the 21 Binet cloud, as well as Europe and Asian Pacific. So, so I'm gonna talk uh, briefly about what we chose to deploy at, uh, at Ford. Uh, we deployed PCF 1.5. Uh, at the time, 1.6 was out, but 1.5 uh, was a little more stable. And going forward at the very bleeding edge as we are on Azure, we want to give them something a little more stable. We deployed Rabbit and MySQL to support the Spring Cloud services for service discovery and config management. We deployed the Gemfire PCF tile for uh, data sync and Opsmetrics for the JMX uh, endpoints. Uh, one of the first major discussions that we had was which load balancer to use. Ford uses F5s on-prem. They have very good knowledge with it. They're very used to doing it. But they wanted to try something a little different when they moved to Azure. Obviously, we could have gone HA proxy, tried in true, but you can't get Bosch managed HA proxy as your edge device without with zero downtime. So in the end, we decided to go with the Azure uh, primitives, uh, in particular the Azure load balancer as our edge device, as you can see here. So the Azure load balancer sits on the edge and forwards traffic to HA proxy, which are then Bosch managed to give us that Bosch goodness, where we terminate SSL and forward traffic into the Go routers. So this is the, the rough diagram of what a single foundation looks like, because then we had the next topology question of single or dual deployment. Obviously, we wanted to go as many deployments as possible for HA, but that leads to other questions. Uh, Ford has the vehicle SDN, which is one of their products that a lot of the apps are going to need to integrate into. That's only available in certain regions. This influenced our design as to where we were going to deploy. Also, there were certain latency requirements that we had to take into account. Uh, we decided to go at the end of the day with the active-active east-west deployments, again, utilizing the Azure primitives of the traffic manager for the GTL and DNS that points to the Azure load balancers feeding traffic in and using the Gemfire WAN replication to handle data sync between the regions. 
Uh, the Active Active allows for many good things, including the maintenance. We can take down one side and still have full traffic on the other side for the troubleshooting maintenance that needs to happen. Downtime does happen. This is the real world. Things happen, so it's good to have both sides active should one of those things fall down. Hayden. Yep, thanks. <clears throat> okay, so let's, uh, let's jump into a little bit of a primer around um, some of the best practices, lessons learned, um, and an advice we would give to people that want to deploy to Azure. Um, we're going to cover a couple mini topics here. Um, I'm going to keep this reasonably brief. Uh, John Sermon from Microsoft and I have a session tomorrow, uh, which is basically an open forum where we're going to be discussing a lot of these in a lot more depth and throwing it open to questions. So we invite you to come along and ask us more questions based on what you're about to hear here. So the things that I want to cover are availability sets. These are not availability zones um, that you'd probably be aware of. Um, they use fault domains, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, talk about the TCP Keep Alive, which, and I think everybody on the stage and everybody at Ford and Microsoft and quite a few of you from Pivotal will agree, this is one of the most pivotal, excuse the pun, um, <laughs> uh, features to enable when you're deploying to Azure. I also uh, want to talk very briefly and just kind of touch on uh, the Bosch Azure CPI um, and then talk a little bit about storage accounts and what they are. Okay, so at Pivotal we talk about the four levels of high availability. One of those is using availability zones to provide resiliency um, when you've got multiple jobs. So for instance, if you've got um, HA proxy, you want to have that in a separate availability zone or a separate fault domain to provide resiliency in case that fault domain or availability zone goes down. Azure has a slightly different concept and it's pretty cool. So what it what happens is it's actually perpendicular to a fault domain. So Azure is super smart and all you need to do is say, hey, this job is part of an availability set and then Azure will take those VMs and automatically deploy them across fault domains. So pretty cool tech. One of the unfortunate things about it being so smart is that Bosch also expects to be in control. All right, so that causes a slight conflict, but as you can see um, when we go to the next slide, it, it still works pretty well. Right. It's important to note that Azure treats a single virtual machine quite differently to a virtual machine as part of an availability set. Right. There is a lot more notification that happens if it's a single virtual machine. Um, so we still do have singleton jobs in our deployment. Um, so we left those as not part of an availability set. So not part of an availability set of one, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, it's, it's important if you have highly available jobs that you're deploying more than one instance of, to put them into an availability set. Okay, so what happens in an availability set? If you specify something here, for instance, let's say these are NATS VMs, um, and you specify an availability set called AS-CF-NATS, if one of these VMs goes away, Azure will automatically bring it back, probably in another fault domain, right? So it automatically handles that for you. You don't need to split your resource pools into two sections and define different regions or availability zones. It's simply a one-line entry into the cloud properties of the resource pools. So hopefully everybody recognizes this part and parcel of doing Bosch deployed CF. All right, these are some of the... Uh, Cloud properties that you have with Azure, so you have an instance type, which defines the size of the VM, obviously. Uh, availability sets, and then you can define storage accounts that back these virtual machines. So we'll talk about that um, in a minute. One of the key moments for us, as I mentioned before, was when we found that there were some networking issues that we were observing uh, when deploying CF on Azure. And this is basically because of the way the Azure load balancer works. So we were advised by Microsoft to include a TCP keep alive, which Dimitri very quickly made a, um, a release for, and we deployed it using a, the Bosch update runtime config. All right, so we say that this is required for any Azure environment. Personally seeing it go from not stable to stable, right, in terms of networking issues, networking issues, to no networking issues, right? So paramount. 
I've also included some information around um, how to actually deploy this. Um, again, thanks, Dimitri, Ben Black, um, and everybody involved. And then, again, just touching on the CPI, um, Microsoft has been super responsive to all of the feature requests and all of the bug re reports that we've put in and are rapidly iterating over their CPI. With the release of CPI v11, there are some important um, patches that have gone into that that we recommend that everybody uses. Um, but be aware that when deploying with Azure, you will be iterating over what CPI you're using quite regularly. All right, this is a good thing because we want rapid development. Right? Rapid development is fantastic. Okay, so let's touch briefly on storage accounts. Currently, the Windows Azure storage system that backs um, all of the Cloud Foundry deployments uh, does have some limitations in storage accounts. So the storage accounts for regular storage have an IOPS limit of 20,000 IOPS. Right, this means that each storage account can service approximately 40 virtual machines. All right, so for a POC, that's fine, because if you're in uh, the Microsoft talk a little bit earlier today, uh, you would have heard that they deployed about 36 VMs. All right, that's fine. But as you start to scale in a large enterprise environment, you need to be super cognizant of what your storage accounts are that back your virtual machines. Right, so at Ford, what we did was each deployment had a separate storage account. So we deployed Gemfire, that had a separate storage account, unless it was a super big deployment of Gemfire, and then it had multiple storage accounts. Same with CF. We deployed CF with one storage account for everything except for the runners, and that was a separate storage account. So again, that's how you define a storage account. One of the final recommendations that we received from Microsoft was to use premium storage over regular storage. We saw a 25 to 100% real world increase in performance. Apparently there is a lower fault rate. We didn't see any faults, so that was great. And there is a documented migration methodology right, that we can, uh, we can run through at the end if we have a little bit more time. So I'll pass it back to Mosin for some of the engineering challenges. All right, thank you. <clears throat> So, so we encountered a number of challenges, and those of you that were part of the keynote uh, in the morning, uh, I could relate to the comments of the speaker for Allstate that it wasn't all rainbow and butterflies. We, we had a set of challenges that we worked towards resolving and finding the workarounds. So starting off, uh, we had pretty much issues around compute, storage, and network. For example, on the compute side, the, the ratio of the memory to cores, uh, Azure didn't have a flexible offering, uh, especially for Gemfire, we were looking at a higher memory VM as opposed to a higher core, uh, but we ended up uh, consuming higher core count. And since we're, we are being charged by the core, there's a cost implication for that. Uh, as Hayden mentioned, we transitioned and migrated from standard to premium storage. And there is still, we are waiting for the availability of uh, availability zones. Around the network side, the whole process of SSL termination, encrypting the data in flight and at rest, and the overall failover and replication. Using the security uh, for wildcards, SSLs, and DNS, that was a requirement by Pivotal to be supported, uh, which was new to the Ford uh, since we've never done it. And there was uh, some concerns which were valid. So we did work around those uh, by developing a solid onboarding process for developers and putting controls in place for promoting code from low to higher environments. The open source components, uh, Ford has a very stringent review process for contracts with the licensing and terms and conditions. And with Pivotal using all open source, we had to go through the, the entire review process with the legal team. Uh, that has been now streamlined to allow for quick approval. Uh, on the Azure side, from our experience, we've seen there's a lack of robust tool set uh, on the, uh, for Pivotal on the, the Azure space. Uh, the product is more mature uh, in AWS uh, and VMware. Uh, and we have uh, some enhancement requests that have been worked on, especially around the availability of Ops Manager in Azure. On the documentation side, we, we saw some gaps. Uh, so there is a potential for some improvement, adding some more details and alignment. For, for logging, uh, 
since, uh, as uh, Shaji mentioned, we are using Splunk. Uh, and when we initially uh, configured Firehose to syslog, that opened up the floodgate for logs. Uh, on the Splunk side, we are charged by the amount of data, uh, and it's expensive. So we had to do the filtering at the syslog level to, to filter the logs. For monitoring, we did a lot of work uh, with the GMX and Ops metrics integration with Splunk, uh, creating dashboard and alerts for our operations teams. On Gemfire, we've seen that there is some scalability uh, with the plans that you can have in the manifest. Uh, for scalability, uh, we are going through an exercise right now for doing the, the right sizing for the environment. Uh, for ADFS, it's about getting the right metadata and using the proper claims for authentication. I would say right now, uh, the Pivotal Cloud Foundry, the phase we are going through is high maintenance because of the, the continuous iteration on the platform side as well. The, the frequent release of uh, Bosch CPI, stem cells, and CF services like RabbitMQ, Gemfire, and Spring Cloud services requires us to continuously patch, upgrade, and roll out. We are working on automation and overall patching process to streamline it. That concludes our presentation. And before we open the stage for, open up the floor for q and I'd like Hayden to give a final message to the audience. Thanks, Mason. So I basically wanted to say thank you to everybody that's been involved um, at the Ford uh, account across Ford Motor Company, Pivotal, and Microsoft. Right. I see very much deployments on Azure as being awesome and only getting better from here on in. Right. So the fact that we have this concept called availability sets, as we start to use this more and we see other people use this, in addition to availability zones, which is coming, and managed disk, which will remove all of the limitations with storage accounts, Azure is actually going to be able to provide probably a fifth level of high availability, right, on top of all the other levels that Cloud Foundry automatically provides for you. So again, thank you to everybody involved, and shout out to Duncan Wynn, keep calm and CF push on Microsoft Azure. <laughs> thank you. So how are we going on time? Do we have time for questions? A couple of minutes. Cool. No questions at all? <laughs> I'd love to commit Ford to that, but I think I might get in trouble. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> there are some Ford Hot Wheels. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so again, big shout out, uh, especially to John Sermon. Uh, please come and see our talk tomorrow. Ask us lots of questions. It's essentially an open forum. Um, yeah, thank you. And if you have any question and answers, just track us down. We'll be glad to help. Thank you for coming.